Good afternoon, Excellencies, Honourable Ministers, Honoured Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. My name is Dumi Makhabo. A very good afternoon to you. Um, I shan't say welcome to Kigali, even though this is my first visit here and I'm thrilled to be here. We are about to get our session underway discussing the issue of leadership and looking at how we want our continent to look in the next few decades and how it is that we intend to get there. Our panelists will be joining us in a short moment, but before they do that, I just want to remind you of a few housekeeping notes, if I may. Those of you who do tweet, the hashtag is AFDBAM2014. So, African Development Bank Annual Meeting 2014, AFDBAM 2014. Translation in English is available on Channel 2, translation in French is available on Channel 3, and translation in Spanish is available on Channel 4. So, those of you who will be needing requirement, uh, translation, I believe that you already do have your headset, so be sure to select the appropriate channel. This session will be, as you can see the cameras, will be uh, uh, broadcast. There will be a live stream of this session, and the feed also will be available for media to, to, to cover. So just so you know that this is indeed going out into the wide world. Now, I understand that our panelists will be making their way down shortly, and how I'm going to conduct this session, because we are running just a few minutes behind session uh, schedule, is to have an initial discussion with the panelists up here on the stage, I will then come down and join you uh, on the floor so we can really get an interactive session going on. We will be taking questions from the floor. I do ask, though, when it is your turn to speak, please, please, and please again, keep your remarks as brief as possible. We want to try to get as many voices into this session as we possibly can, and we can't do that if we each uh, have a bit of a monologue. So I'm going to ask you in advance that you do so. And if I may say, I will politely ask, politely ask you to stop if you are going on a little bit too long, and I don't want to be in that position. So please, I'm asking in advance uh, if you can please make sure that you keep your remarks um, brief. One other question, if I can just, or note, if I can just ask that you make sure that the uh, attachment that is attached to your hand, otherwise known as a mobile phone, Please make sure that it is on silent. I know that many of you aren't too keen on uh, turning it off, so I'm not going to ask you to do so, even if you don't tweet. Just make sure that it is on silent so that uh, we are, don't have any interruptions during this session. In addition to that, we just have a little bit of a change in terms of how we're going to run this session. We're going to be calling shortly on the president of the African Development Bank, who will be officially welcoming our panelists here this afternoon. And then once he has done so, we will actually be able to get the session underway. So I think that kind of clarifies how all is, everything is going to work. I have already been approached by some people saying, I already know that I want to ask a question. Well, thanks for approaching me, but we will uh, take the questions as and when they come a little later on. So, ladies and gentlemen, joining us now are our panelists. I think if you can please give them a warm welcome as they join us on the stage. I'm well, how are you? Good to see you again. Mama?
and a very important gentleman whom I think without whom we certainly wouldn't be having some of these really lively and interesting debates. So if I can please ask you to give a very warm round of applause to the president of the African Development Bank, Mr. Donald Kadirika. Thank you, Tony. Some of you may have noticed that I was on the panel, but when I saw the list of panelists, I concluded that my contributions would be very limited. <laughs> so I switched with Mo Ibrahim. So my task is an easy one, to say thank you to all of you for attending the meeting of the African Development Bank in Kigali. This is an important year for us, it's our golden jubilee, and we're proud that so many of you could find time to join us. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, the moderator. Thank all of you. The theme of this uh, annual meeting is the Africa we want, or rather we want for our children, which means a process of transformation, which requires leaders. But a mistake is always made, though, when we say leaders it does not mean only political leaders. Remember, the financial crisis was not caused by political leaders. It was caused by business leaders. It was caused by Wall Street. In short, there was a failure of leadership on Wall Street. So today, we're not talking about political leaders only. It's leaders at all levels and what they must do for the transformation of Africa. Second, it's not simply about Africa. I have many European friends, many friends from North America who think in the aftermath of the political crisis, there is a deficit in leadership all over the world. That too has to be addressed. In fact, the World Economic Forum two years ago ran a survey around the world to identify issues of concern to citizens of the world, and these were the top two issues. Number one, there is less and less trust between citizens and leaders in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. But even worse, there is less trust in the policies they put in place. Citizens don't have faith that those policies are not short-termism to get elected, re-elected. They don't have faith that those policies will work. But now today, it's about Africa and her future and her transformation. And we have a great panel here and I leave that to, to me. But thank all of you for coming to Kigali and to our annual general meeting. Thank you so much. President Kamiruka, thank you very much for that very warm welcome. Even though I think you did take a little bit of my job away, but that's okay. You did invite me to be here, so I'm glad to be here. Of course, we have a number of distinguished guests, and as I indicated, this is really uh, supposed to be a discussion and an engagement. So um, I hope that uh, it'll be okay with my panelists if I step down, because this entire conversation is going to be with me down there, so we can ensure that we have a lively debate. So if you'll give me one second. Okay, it's a little bit more than one second. But... Perhaps if I could begin with you, former President Obasanjo. Why me? <laughs> I'll tell you why. <laughs> already I'm at a I'm already at a loss. What am I gonna do? Okay. Let me tell you let me tell you specifically why you. There are there are many instances <laughs> there are No the reason why I ask is that um, President Sabombeki is directly behind you, and, she, <laughs> and there's no love lost between me and him. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to, to former President Becky as well, so uh, this, is, this is maybe the warm-up, if I can say, but all right, uh, if we can get on to the, the topic at hand. The reality of the matter is that we on this continent have the highest concentration of young people of anywhere else in the world. And in reality, a lot of these young people want to get educated, of course they want to be fed, etc. But they want to also be able to have a future in which they can work so that they can also provide for their own families moving forward. But as things currently stand, it's not looking promising for many of those young people because the reality is that the jobs aren't there. 
If then we are going to talk about looking at leadership moving forward, in this environment, where would we begin? You have had a look at this continent from almost every angle. And that's the question to you first. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Madrito. Um, our, our theme and subject is leadership for the Africa we want. I think the beginning for me is what Africa do we want? We have to, that, that, that must be the starting point. And if we can agree, and I don't think it should be difficult for us to agree on the African, uh, the, on the Africa we want. Africa, where nobody will feel oppressed. Africa, where everybody will have opportunity. Africa, where there will be democracy and full participation. Africa, where everybody will be able to develop its potentials. Africa, which belongs to all Africans and those who want to live in Africa and work and um, be with us. You, you raise a point. I was very uncomfortable about six months ago. A Nigerian young girl, well, if you can call her young girl, 27 year old, wrote me a letter and said, I am worried and I am constrained to write you this letter because I'm in a situation where we have a past that I do not understand. We have a present that is confusing and we have a future that I don't have confidence in. Now, and I think that more or less, more or less captures the feeling of the youth. And of course, I wrote back to her and said, look, we need to talk. And she brought about 15 of her peers, boys and girls. I will spend a whole night talking about the past, the present, and the future. And they are not asking for anything that is extraordinary. And I said to them, I said, look, in my time, there were not many facilities, but there were opportunities. Today, maybe there are more facilities, but the opportunities have diminished. How, we, how can we enhance and increase the opportunities for them? And there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to. We have heard of uh, transformation, uh, transformation leadership, visionary leadership, um, servant leadership, and all that. <laughs> Any leadership, uh, and whether it's in the, in the private sector, in the public sector, in the church, in the diplomacy, even in farming, any leadership that has no vision is no leadership. Any leadership that has no, uh, that cannot transform is no leadership. Any leadership that uh, cannot bring up uh, successor is no leadership. So all these uh, qualification of leadership, I think we are begging the question. A leader must be a leader. And the job of a leader is to lead. Lead in all aspects of the form. Now, how can we get 
leaders for the Africa that we need. I believe that we have some leaders that are performing, whichever walks of life you look at it. But my position is that we don't have a critical mass of those leaders that are performing. We need critical mass of performing leaders in all walks of life. And when we get there, when we have that, we will get to where we want to get to as Africans and as Africa. Thank you. Mo well, Ibrahim, if I can come to you. Um, I, yes, you. I had the, 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 the good fortune and privilege of listening to you at the annual Nelson Mandela lecture uh, when you spoke. And you certainly didn't, uh, shall we say, mince your words. You were very, very honest and very, very frank. Former President Obasan just says, how? And you recognize clearly that there is a lack, and I don't think there's anybody in the room who's going to argue differently. How? How do we go about doing that? Because in reality, we need to, and he's right, we need to look at where we want to go and tailor ourselves accordingly. How do we do that? There is one. Well, I'm the only common person. You this have one banner. right there. Oh, I have <laughs> yep. this one. Okay. You have a special one. <laughs> I thought the uh, civil society doesn't, doesn't get a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> You almost were okay, starting, thank, thank almost. You. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, please allow me to be frank and with respect to many wonderful people around this room here, I'm gonna speak in general terms. So nobody please take personal offense. Uh, I wish to start really from where uh, President Obasanjo ended. Let us start by looking at, at the age issue. You, you politely bought it and said, I like to see a critical mass. You see, I've been president for a long time. That's why I'm always careful with your words. Uh, now, this continent is a continent of young people. Half of our people here are below 20 years old. Yes? Look at the average age of our presidents. It's about 63, 64 years old. We have, we are the only country in the continent in the world we have, where we have presidents at 90 years old starting new terms. <laughs> I mean, you guys are crazy or what? <laughs> We've seen people in wheelchairs, you know, unable to raise hands to standing for elections. This is a joke. Yes, you are right to laugh because the whole world is laughing at us. You know, I, I, I always say, I mean, you look around you. you. You look, United States, an economy of 15, 16 trillion dollars. We, all of Africa, are less than one trillion dollar. This is a 15, 16 trillion dollar economy, right? the most important country in the world, like it or not. Obama, who happened to be half African anyway, become president when he's 46, 47 years old, he's president. If, if Obama was in Kenya, what he would be doing now? He would be driving a bus maybe. <laughs> yeah? You look, really, and, and he's not the youngest president. Clinton was younger than him. Clinton became president at 46 years old. Kennedy was 40 years old, 40 odd subject years old, and he became president. Why these big countries, much bigger than us, entrust their economies, their nuclear weapons, their oil resources to people who are in their 40s? And we only pick up people at 90 years old to lead us. To lead us where? <laughs> to the grave? You agree? <laughs> you don't agree. I'm, I'm I know he's your friend, but <laughs> just now. 
<laughs> I need to re sorry. reestablish okay. order now. I need to reestablish order. Okay. Okay. So, so. So, yeah. I'm, I'm not allowed to laugh, so okay. I'm trying really hard to, to, to refocus. You this didn't discussion. interrupt him because he's a president. You no, interrupted me. I'm, I'm trying to refocus you. I need you to refocus. No, you are getting jealous. You are getting jealous. <laughs> yeah, of course I'm jealous. <laughs> you are brilliant and handsome too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so how? So what is the how? So we, we can identify what the problems are, and I don't think anybody's, you know, we're all laughing, but in reality it is a challenge that we have on this continent. Yeah. So how? How do we remedy that? How do we fix that? Yeah, I think, I think really we need our youth to have the space. We really need to look at our political organizations, our institutions, etc. And we need, this is a young continent, and we need to appreciate that we don't understand the world of those young people. We are out of touch. We, we have to accept that. The future of those guys who are not gonna be there to live it. There's a lot of new challenges facing this new generation, which we have no grips to get the grips with it. And we need to find a way now to bring those younger people more into power. It is the job of us, our current leadership, to try and empower this young generation to bring them in. I can see this happening in some countries. I can see some of the, and interestingly, it is some of the younger presidents in Africa whom now you go and meet their cabinet and to see really a lot of young people, a lot of young women sitting there. I mean, that's, that's really refreshing. And uh, so we need to empower and trust this young generation to come forward. They have the energy, they have the know-how, they understand the age, that will help us to move forward. Madam uh, Lamini Zuma, if I can come to, if I can come to you uh, on this point. Thank you. If I can come to you on this point. You sit in a, in a very challenging spot because you sit and look at the whole continent and have to take into consideration a lot of nuance. So when you all gather uh, in Addis, there's a lot of nuance that goes into that discussion. However, this question of leadership in order to create the Africa we want is fundamental. Is there a real and sufficient political will from where you sit for that to actually happen, for us to effect change and have the kind of leaders who can help us deliver the continent we want. I was hoping that you are not going to ask me to diagnose the, the leadership that sits in Addis. Um, well, I'll, I'll just speak from a different angle. He said he's the only one from civil society. I'm the only one from the other half. Um, let, let me put it this way. I think we need a leadership that thinks African, that thinks about Africa as a whole, not about their little or uh, little countries because together we are a big continent, but individually we are very small. So I think we need that kind of leadership. And I think we need a leadership that believes that the Africans, the young people he's talking about, can be the best. And therefore, a leadership that is going to invest heavily on the young people. Invest in them. If, if, you, if we want to get to prosperity, because that's one of the things, a modern, prosperous Africa that we want, we're not going to get there unless we have the young people, the women, to really drive that development. So you need leadership that can sit and say, this year we are going to produce 100,000 engineers. China today produces more than 700 engineers a year. 700,000 a year. We produce how many? We're almost the same population just over 20,000 a year. The EU is around more than 200,000. So you can see 
that we need. I, I, I'm a great believer that if we skill our young people properly, they'll figure out what to do. But I also believe that we need leadership. I'm happy I'm sitting next to President Kagame, who is a champion for uh, technology in the AU. Because I think in order to, to be able to skill our young people in huge numbers that we need, we need to use technology as well. Physically, the universities and other institutions of higher learning are not enough. But we, we can't build them enough, but we don't need to. We can now have our young people studying in virtual space, and that's what we need to go to. But in order for that to succeed, of course we need to talk to the universities and colleges of higher learning, but to the leadership in business. Because if you are going to train an engineer in a virtual space, yes, theoretically you can, but practically you need to get practical. So we need all of us, politicians, we need leadership in business, leadership in academia, to, to work together to do that. That's, that's the first thing, those are the kind of leaders I think we need. Because if we believe in ourselves and believe that we can be the best, we will be the best. And of course, women, they are very scarce, generally, can look around. But I was in a meeting yesterday with the, the governor of New Zealand and he said something very interesting. He said he's a great believer in getting women empowered, giving them responsibilities, because he believes that if you give tasks to women, uh, there is an 80% chance that it will be done well. But I also think we, we need leadership that can inspire, I don't know about age, maybe me and you shouldn't be sitting here, because I don't think we're 40 anymore. Maybe this side, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond the age, you need leadership that can inspire other people to be their best. Because I don't believe necessarily that you only need only young people. Even in, the, in America, if you look at who is the president and who's the vice, there's always <laughs> a balance because you need the creativity, vitality, energy of age, but you also need the wisdom of experience. So you need both of them to work together. Oh, you're stopping me. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was getting a bit uh, worried because I think there are a number of points that you've made that we need to actually unpack. So if I can just start on the question and, and, and if I can address this to you, uh, President Kagame. The reality of the matter is that, again, there aren't going to be many people who are going to argue with anything that's been said thus far in this session. But the reality is that it does take time. I'm not saying it takes 50 years, 20 years, but it does take time. There are elections. People have to volunteer. They have to step up. They have to get along in a political context. But equally, in terms of a societal context, you don't just wake up one day and say, OK, now I'm leading this group of young people. That takes time, too. What do we do in the interim? What are some of the quicker interventions that one can begin thinking about so we can get there a little bit faster? The concern, perhaps by many, is that if we wait 50 years for that to happen, we're going to be having the same conversation in 50 years' time. See, that's what makes this subject a very complicated one. 
In actual fact, we've been waiting for more than 50 years already. Here we are discussing this. Because to be able to define the leadership relative to Africa we want, maybe this has been the question even before I was born. And the main effort has been in the theoretical part of leadership. We've talked so much about leadership and what is expected of leadership. We have also had so much time talking about and defining the problems of Africa. What has been lacking is the practical side of it. How do we get to do what we know we ought to so that Africa can get better? This is where the problem lies. And so that requires, therefore, that we simply look at different cases and say, what went wrong here? And how can it be corrected? Or how did these things happen here so that we can learn from this and maybe replicate it elsewhere? But the complexity of it is that we have not even been short of lessons to learn from. So th there is something fundamentally wrong that I cannot explain. We know the problem. We actually every time discuss solutions. Everybody, if we sat here and they passed the pieces of paper around for us to do a test on leadership, we would all get A's. <laughs> and this has been the case for so long. But what happens when it comes to delivery of what we know we must deliver for our people? What happens is something I can simply not very easily explain. Now, but let me quickly touch on and build on what some other people have said, issues of age and so on and so forth. Oh, we have seen young people mess up like you've never seen. <laughs> so it's not an issue of age, much as I would agree with what Moore said to an extent, but not entirely. Because even leaders, whether young or whatever age, you see, all of us grow through a system, something. You see, developing leaders or leaders to develop requires some kind of upbringing. You know, the, the, the environment, the things that affect these leaders or affect the people and, and so on. That's how leaders may emerge. But I'm talking about this just to give you a quick example. In, in our situation here, you see Rwanda is a case for a very bad example of failure. It's also a case for some progress, if you will. But if you look at what happened here 20 years ago, the genocide had almost the entire population, but the majority of them being young people. They were led into doing what they did that cost us one million lives, young people. But of course, what went wrong was politics and the leaders, irrespective of age. We had leaders here who taught our people that they belong to this one eth ethnic group. It's the majority. It must be the one with the power. And all the others should be excluded, not only excluded, but killed. And you know what happened? For example, just take an example of an ordinary person who has nothing at home not, not even a chicken to look after, not a goat, nothing. But he's taught to believe, we say, you are a Hutu, Hutu power. And the guy claps and says, yes, Hutu power. 
But what do you have in it? Now, what this means, the leaders who are teaching them that, they thrive on that, they play on that, because they have everything in their own hands, even at their expense. When there is a competition for resources or power or things like that, he calls upon the other one, who has really nothing apart from indoctrination, and tells him, your neighbor who is different from you is a danger to you. And then mobilizes him and says, you know, because he's a danger to you, you go and kill him and take over whatever he has. Now, driven by this poverty, this person has been pushed into, follows instructions even before they are fully issued. Now, this is the leadership Africa, this is the leadership Rwanda has had for such a long time. Now, imagine this ordinary person very poor, with the jiggers in his feet. He's made to be drunk with something called Hutu power. And he thinks it means anything. No, it is jigger power, not, not, not Hutu power. He has nothing. But he's made, so the leaders we have had in the past are this kind of leaders. So we have to reverse that. We have to make sure that leaders are there for a purpose. And the purpose is to lead, is to work towards development, transformation, betterment of their people's lives. There's no question about it. So the practical side of it, the delivery, leaders must deliver on what they are expected. But the do. truth of the matter is that leaders come from society. Leaders come from society, right. right? So they come from everywhere. We can look in this room, look at all of you who are sitting up here, and even if we go into the floor, sure. we, all our backgrounds are varied. So is the question or the issue around the leaders, or is the issue around the societies that we're creating that actually bear fruit to those leaders? If I could put that question to you. How do we, how do we begin sort of making sense of that dynamic? Because otherwise, again, we'll be talking in half a decade, uh, half a century, a century. Thank you very much. My name is William Ruto, <laughs> just for the record. And I shall apologize. <laughs> uh, let me pick up from where President Kagame left. And he couldn't have put it better by saying, that um, the issue is not so much what the problem is or what the solutions are. The issue is we know the problem and we have a good account of what the solution could possibly be. Standing between the problem and the solution is a critical entity called leaders. People who need to bridge, to create a bridge between the problem and where we want to go. The present and the Africa that we want. Leaders. I will squarely say that those of us who have been given or have been entrusted with the responsibility to lead must match what we say with what we do. That is what will make the difference. Let me give you uh, a very practical example. The last elections in Kenya, the, 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 the president and myself went on a slogan, Kusema na Kutenda, meaning to walk the talk or to match what we say 
with what we do. That is what Kenyans bought into. And therefore, for us as a continent, and I have listened carefully to very eminent persons who have spoken here, we have what it takes. We know where we want to go. We know how to get there. Standing between us and where we want to go is decisive, bold, pragmatic decisions that will take leaders to make. Even to move society, assuming that society is part of our challenge, it will take leaders to inspire society to make sure society sees what the future holds for all of us. And therefore, I am a very proud African, and, and, I, and I am confident. And looking around, and I have been, uh, in the last one year or so, I have been to various meetings around this continent. I see a lot of prepared African leaders, people who are prepared to make the critical decisions that will take us to the Africa we want. Let me give you an example. In the last one year, as East Africans, we have made decisions that has taken 50 years for them to be made. In the last one year, we have made a decision, for example, that we must bring down the barriers. And instead of having borders that act as roadblocks, we should get borders that act as bridges. That is why I didn't need a passport to come from Kenya to Rwanda. I just needed my identification card. I mean, it would, have, it would have been very difficult to make that decision in the face of all the challenges we have about security and all the rest of it. But on the balance of issues, the good that comes with eliminating the barriers that exist currently as borders far supersedes the negatives that would accompany that decision. That is why the leaders of East Africa made that decision. Let me give you another example. In the last one year, jointly with another five countries in the East African region, Rwanda included, we have launched the first ever standard gauge railway out of Mombasa to Kampala, to Kigali, to South Sudan. It was done last week. It has taken us 100 years. The railway we are using was built not last century. It was built the century before. <laughs> right? And yet, it is absolutely clear to all of us that by having a standard gauge railway, we can reduce the cost of transport by anything up to 70% and make the uh, products that we produce much more competitive open up markets for, for our products and make sure that we create more integration, create more jobs, and create a prosperous region. That is the kind of decisions that need to be made so that we can take this, country, uh, this continent and this region to the next level. And I am confident, very confident, as a young leader in this continent, that we are going to make those decisions. <laughs> Deputy President Ruta, thank you very much. Okay, we've got 30 minutes, and I know that there are a number of people who want to speak from the floor, and I will get to you uh, shortly. But there is also um, a gentleman uh, on the floor who I can't resist but come to. Yes, and I'm going to start with you, former President Mbeki. It, not last century, but the century before mm. was when the railway mm. line was built, mm. but the train is now running as of now. So it took 100 years for us to get here. 
But the reality is that we don't have another 100 years to spend for the next set of development. What needs to change? In the context, everybody's familiar with the notion of the African Renaissance, but the practicable and element of, of that, the how, how do we get there? Yes, we need young, dynamic leaders, but the challenge is we may not necessarily have enough of them in the right space to get us there. The modern moderator is this thing working? It is. It's not. No, it's not. It's not. Can we have one that's working, please? May I borrow yours? It's not a civil per issue, I promise. It's not. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm also civil society. <laughs> no, but I think the, to me, the, 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 the way the panelists approach this thing is correct to say we have to answer this question first. What is the Africa we want? So we say we want an Africa that is free of violent conflict and war. What leadership do you produce to get that result? We want an Africa that is free from poverty. What kind of leadership do you need to create to, to end that poverty? We want an Africa that is free of, that, that, that is driven by women's emancipation. Where is this leadership? How do you create it? We want an Africa that is free of corruption. How do you produce this leadership that is not corrupt? Now, these are the questions I took or to answer these practical things that President Kagame was talking about. And it's not an easy question to answer. But I think critically, and we were discussing this thing yesterday, critically, we need a critical self-assessment of ourselves as Africans. To say, as, as, President, as President Kagame was saying, we've been discussing this thing about the quality of leadership, challenges we face for a very long time. But when have we sat down to say, now let us assess, you know, you, you, you Tabo Mbegi, were president of South Africa for so long. Let's assess your performance. Did you provide this kind of leadership that is suitable for this Africa that we want? Where did you go wrong? We've got the African peer review mechanism, which President Obasanjo can sp speak about. That's part of what it was supposed to do, so that we sit as peers to say, no, but the President, you are misbehaving. You are stealing public resources. You've accessed power in order to put money in your pocket. This is not the leadership we want. But we're not doing that sufficiently because we're afraid. We're afraid to speak frankly to one another about the wrong things that we're doing. And I think if we don't do that, we will meet a century hence to discuss the same question. I think that critical self-assessment of the continent is necessary. And I mean a real, critical, truthful self-assessment that's critical. And I think that's a very, that would be an important step forward in terms of uh, producing this kind of leadership which Africa wants. I'm handing this to President Kapp. I, I suspected you might do that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what a cruel gesture, Tabo. <clears throat> we want in Africa, as you said, where there is equality of gender, equality of opportunity, um, promise of a good, healthy life, promise of an educated society, promise of a leadership that thinks more about service than being served. We want all of that, borders to, 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 to be removed and so on. Why don't we have it? My answer is very clear. Because you have a selfish leadership. Extremely selfish. We often think we often think of the problem of leadership as being the problem of the leaders alone. Fine. They must be defined, have integrity, have all those we want. But to succeed, they must be able to implant those attributes in the population. Their political parties must be organized in such a way that they reflect those values and embody those aspirations in their political interaction. 
If they don't, you have trouble. We are multi-ethnic societies. What basic values have we embodied in these societies? Equality or is it diversity? How do you convert diversity into strength rather than diversity as a cause for war and internecine fighting? Can it be done? It can be done. It's been done in centuries before in Europe and elsewhere. Why can't it be done in Africa? But we don't have the will because we are selfish. We are concerned of the here and now in the seat I am in. That's wrong. We have, you know, it's ironical that you have a, a continent with the best natural resources of any others as of today. But they are being exploited for the sustenance of those who enslaved us and continue exploiting us rather than being exploited for our own emancipation. <laughs> Why? Because you have a leadership that does not recognize the degree of present day, uh, present day enslavement, economic enslavement, and the necessity for, uh, for, for, for emancipation. It's ironical. We, we talk about development, but we don't stop in time to define what development in our kind of situation is. One of the greatest reasons of admiration for this country, for instance, is the fact that you have here a universal system of health and education delivery. <laughs> now, that is development. Rwanda is more developed than any of these Western countries in this regard, where you have assured health and education delivery. So, we really must rethink where we are, why we are what we are, what we can be, and how we can. I agree, women, youth, and all those things. But internally, the fault is in us, dear Brutus, not in our stars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I can have people, I'm going to go to the floor. If people can please raise your hands. If you have a question, I ask that you please be clear about whom you're directing it to, first off. And then also introduce yourself and the organization that you represent, so at least we have a sense of whom we're speaking to. Madame, if I can ask you to give that lady the microphone. Do we have another microphone on this side? Do we only have the one microphone? Okay. So, good afternoon. Nairi Woods, Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. We have at least four presidents on the panel. Um, it's very difficult for outstanding leaders of any organization to think about their succession. My question to the four presidents is, what do each of you think are the most important steps you need to take in order to ensure that your succession is a positive and smooth one. Thank you. Can I, can I, can I do, do, take a bit of an executive uh, decision on this and direct it to uh, President Kagame and to Deputy President Ruto so we can get as many interactions as possible? I know I'm editing your request, but I'm sure you'll indulge me. If I can go with you but first, the, President the, Kagame. The, the, I think to give more value to to, to the question uh, and the meaning of it. It is important to think about what you leave behind for the successor to take over than even to just be succeeded. What I'm saying is, you see, the issue of succession is very important it is, but people have reduced it to an end in itself, to the point that even if you were in power and you did nothing, as long as you are succeeded, that is very good. <laughs> so I think we should combine the two. So for me, I'm thinking beyond being succeeded, I'm actually thinking about what do you leave behind when a successor comes? So otherwise, he could be in power for 10 years, for 20, mess it up, and then say bye-bye, and somebody else comes, uh, you know, takes over, and just screws up uh, the same way as the other one. And that's, by the way, that's also one reason why some of the problems in Africa are there as we see them. We have had 
places where this succession has been going on quite well, but the lives of the citizens have not changed, or they even get worse. So I think it is better to take it holistically and look at the meaning of it. So I think my preoccupation as a leader is to do the best I can while I am there. So that, because what we are managing is just not succession, it is the lives of people. And in fact, the, you see the, the other thing about leaders, yesterday somebody raised the point, he said, he talked about strong leaders and said we shouldn't talk about that, we should be talking about institutions. And I think uh, uh, Tabo Mbeki raised a good point. Even for strong institutions, or institutions that deliver for people, actually don't just happen. They are put in place by people, by leaders. So leaders we want, and therefore, who should be succeeded and things gone as one aspect of what many things that should happen should be leaders that allow the building of institutions that will outlive them. But it is leaders who will still do it, especially when they work well with their people. So looking at the fact, if I may, before I come to you, um, Deputy President, looking at the question on, on, of institutions and recognizing that one does need strong institutions that allow us to continue to develop, the reality, and we've seen it happen time and time again, that the successor, goes about very quickly dismantling said institutions, said support. So you find yourself back at square one within a decade. That's true. So is it about the leadership? Is it about the strong institutions? Is it about a broader recognition that there it's needs a, to be? It's about a combination. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> you, are you addressing it to me or somebody? No, no, to you, to you, to you. Yeah, so. I just was gesturing to him. It's, a, it's about a combination. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's, it's, it's not one thing or, or the other alone. It's a combination of things. It's about leadership that gets things right. It's about, and getting things right as leaders includes creating institutions. Institutions that serve the societies as they are, and not just being locked on to one individual and thinking that is the end of the problem. So it is a combination, there's no doubt. Sometimes you don't know which comes first. It almost looks like a chicken and the egg puzzle, but both or beyond more than both uh, are very important. Mr. Deputy President. Um, Vice President. Strangely, this morning uh, when I left uh, Nairobi, I got an SMS on my phone. Maybe I'll go and check and maybe call that gentleman back. Because uh, the SMS went like this. Um, Mr. Deputy President, my grandfather was a squatter. My father was a squatter. I am a squatter. And my son is likely to be a squatter. What are you going to do about it? This morning. And I think it speaks volumes to the succession you have alluded to. In this sense, as leaders, what kind of continent or nations would we want to hand over to our successors or to the next generation. I think really that is where the bottom line is. And I would dare say that as leaders, it must bother us, and seriously so, that the continent we have inherited, the leadership that maybe has been you've won either in, a, in an election or whatever other means. How will you, I, I think the biggest concern is how much difference will you make so that when, it, when your time comes up, you have something 
to hand over to the next, to the successor or to the next generation. And let me say this. Looking at the situation that I, uh, I was confronted with this morning, it took me to where we are as a continent and the magic that a full stomach carries. The threat of hunger in our continent is to a great extent the base of crime. And grinding poverty to a great extent informs the instability and the insecurity that we have. And again, it requires decision makers, people who can make decisions. Because for a very long time, I have attended, I have been Minister for Agriculture at some point. And you go to some meetings and the discussion is about, oh, you know, smallholder um, agriculture, peace and farming, you know, this is very good. And the people speaking there are professionals. And you really ask yourself, surely Africa is, is Africa going to get out of hunger because of peasant, smallholder farming? I highly doubt. That is why in Kenya, we have rolled out a one million acre commercial farming under irrigation to double our food production in the next 10 years because it is doable and it is practical. And we want to hand over to the next generation of leaders a program that they can pick up and make a bigger difference if they will. And, and that is what I will be proud of the day it comes when, I have to, uh, when, when we will be handing over to the next generation. You shared that SMS with us. What was your response? I was on my way to the airport. That's why so I say pending. it came into my mind. Mm. It is pending. It is in my okay. inbox. I will, I will because I hope, of this I hope discussion. You'll be to, I, I hope you'll be willing to share, to share with us. No, I just wanted to add on this question of succession. And I can speak because I'm not, to, I'm not a president. I'm talking from a citizen point of view. I think the presidents are correct. You need to know what you are living. You need to build institutions. But you also need to build the next layer of leadership. Because if you build and leave something, but you have not built the layer of leadership that will be able to carry on, that's when you'll get people un and doing what the good work that has been done. So I think that element must always be there of building the next layer of leadership. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. After him, one point. Okay. Yes. All right. I've it's, been given a an note that's thing. telling me that I've got five minutes left. Mm -hmm. So I. No, no, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. So I'm just telling you that I have five minutes left. Okay. So I, if I can come to you, yeah. Mr. President, forgive me. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I, I just want to make a, a remark about the issue of succession. I recall a conversation with, I had with, uh, quiet conversation one to one with a, with a president, uh, African president who has been there for very, very long time. President Kagame, you're at, you at a school when he was president. <laughs> and, uh, and I asked him, I said, why, why, look, why, why, do, why do you have to stand again? And his answer was very interesting. He said, I really cannot find a good successor. <laughs> and I said, look, I found this strange in my company uh, when I was, uh, he said, every time I go to the board meeting, the board asks me, what's my succession plan? You know, if your chief executive go under a bus or CFO goes under, the, what's the succession plan? So in any decent company, there must be a succession plan. This is a company. How about a country? There must be some succession plans also for, for the future uh, uh, of the country. And of course, every president will stand or fall by, by their uh, achievement. And one thing I just uh, to hope not be taken out of context. When I was putting the case for young people, I don't say, let's get this stupid young guy and put him in. <laughs> and 
throw all the wise old people in the sea. Okay. You know, I, no, I'm not saying that. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. No, thank you. We, we'll one, take one, minute. one okay. minute. Really one minute, one please, minute. Mr. President. Yes. yes. I, I think on this issue of succession, it is important. You see, even the question and the way it is discussed all the time misses one point. We, we, we put the succession plan or other things around it always on the president or the leader. We should actually be thinking beyond that. Why don't we think about creating environment or a situation where things actually are such that they will determine that this person won't stay for as long as they want? You see, so everyone is just moving towards talking about one person. When are you going? Will you go? Do you want to go? And so on and so forth. No, but the whole issue should be. One minute. Yes, One so minute. it should be. We should be seeing beyond that. Can we, can we create the very institutions we are talking about yeah. to actually determine that somebody cannot stay beyond a certain time? That's yeah. going to be more important. The, the, the wonderful thing. You, you know, everybody's having a really good time. Nobody wants to leave. But uh, thank you very much, President Kabaruka. He's given us 10 extra minutes, which we have to use very, very wisely. So I know this gentleman had his hand up, Madame in the pink jacket, and you, Madame, as well, also had your hands up. If I can take really, really briefly, please. Yes. Uh, my view is that Africa lacks... My, by the way, my name is Fisahatian Mengistu. I'm a professor at the International Leadership Institute in Amsterdam. In, uh, uh, in Addis Ababa, but... I was... I, I, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Right. hold on. If we could just I, settle I, down, I, I was in Amsterdam, so I was influenced by it. Okay, um, the, when I, I, have, I have been an advisor to the Minister of Finance during the Imperial, uh, Imperial Haile Selassie, and I have seen three governments. I have been, I am a pan-Africanist at heart. And when I look at Africa, I honestly feel Africa lacks the type of selfless, dedicated, committed, selfless uh, leaders who are willing to leave a legacy for, the, for their own people. But let me ask one question. And that's very much related to the heart of uh, Madame Zuma. We want strong, united Africa. But where is the money? <laughs> Many of the governments of developing countries, of African countries, are basically not paying the, their, their fees. So we, African countries are not contributing to the type of African unity that they want to see. So there is a contradiction between what they say and what they do. And that is a problem. There is a huge gap between what we say daily and what we do in practice. That is the gap which we need to narrow down. Thank you. Thank you. Madam. He did specifically direct it at you. Oh, yes, I absolutely agree. Part of the problem that we've had all these beautiful plans that have not been implemented is that we make the plans and we expect somebody else to pay for them. I think... We should make the plans, we should find money for them, and then get our friends to assist, not to be the mainstay of our development. No country has been ever developed by donors. So I think that's part of the problem. The plans are there, but if you don't put the money, they will not be implemented, and I think he's absolutely correct. And it comes back to what I said earlier, because we think national only. Yes, we must think national, but we must also think continentally and therefore be willing to give some of the money to the continent. If we are going to succeed in modernizing Africa, connecting our continent with high-speed trains, we need to work together as a continent, not individually. Thank you. My name is Mary Okello from Kenya. 
When the president of the African Bank start, uh, started a session, he said that people are getting less, um, have less trust in leaders and the policies. Who are these leaders and who are making these policies? Are they men or women? <laughs> then the President Obasanjo talked about an Africa that is uh, inclusive, where people participate democratically. There is a UN resolution about 30% of women being in decision making. How many African countries have attained that criteria? We have seen Rwanda as a very good example. We have been told how well it is doing. And when you look at Rwanda, there are many women in decision making positions. My own president talked about eliminating barriers for the good of society. There are many barriers that are keeping women out of decision making. When is Africa going to remove those barriers? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Mujang Kugumbi. Just, just a quick question. Uh, you know, we talk about we know what we need and we know how we need to get there, but it's not happening. I just wanted to say that the, the way in which we answer this question, it cannot be in an aggregated manner, in my view. You have to really disaggregate the issues. President Obasanjo, you know you are a very, very good president. You were and you still are a great leader. But my, you know- my, my political adversaries will not agree with you. <laughs> But even, but even Nigeria went through a bit of a political hiccup when you had to leave office. I mean, President Kagame has done wonderful things in Rwanda, unbelievable things. But with the greatest of respect, and President Kagame knows this, when you take him outside Rwanda to deal with the issues in the neighborhood, I talk about the neighbor here, DRC, you know, for the last 20, 30 years, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. And this is a good leader. It's a good leader who's trying to find solutions. And the challenges come up all the time. My sister and cousin, the continent was divided on her appointment. So I'm just saying you need a little bit of what President Beck is talking about because it's impossible to do it in this panel, I understand but you need a little bit of disaggregation to, if you really want to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've... Jeff, I was trying not to come to you. Oh, yes. You're just gate crashing Thank now. you to me, I yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> My name is Jeff Koinange. I'm, uh, I'm a journalist with KTN in Kenya. I actually have a message for President Becky, President Obasanjo, and President Kagame, because yesterday, many of you were at the session on conflict resolution. Fantastic session, good contributions, and I called my little six-year-old son at home last night, and I told him who I was hanging out with. And of course, he knows President Becky, he can recite, I am an African, back to front. He knows President Obasanjo, President Kagame. And he said, Papa, tell them not to let us down. The kid is six years old. I said, what do you mean? I said, look, he told me, look, Al-Shabaab is hitting us in Kenya. I've heard of Boko Haram in a place called Nigeria. He's heard of South Sudan, he's heard of CAR. He says, tell them not to let us down. Message from a six-year-old. In 10 years' time, he'll be 16. 12 years' time, he'll be voting. That's the next generation that's not too far away. What do I tell this kid when I go back home, President Becky? President Obasanjo, President Kagame. What do I tell this kid? And also, Deputy President Ruta, here's one for you. You're being very modest here. There are very many people outside Kenya that you are fighting to get into office. Many did not want you and the president to be in office. It was the leadership they wanted, not the leadership the people wanted. I think you're being very modest. And maybe that's the same with South Sudan and CAR and other places the leadership we want. I think you should talk a little bit about that. To me, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. 
I am going to, I'm going to, yes, I have to now. I'm being given the sign that says enough, enough, done, done, time is out. Time is out, but I do need to perhaps come back to you. If I can give the last word to our host here in Rwanda on Jeff's question. What do we say? What do we tell them? Well, I think the question is being answered here and we are trying to create that Africa that, uh, and the leadership that doesn't uh, betray the, the young uh, child who, who raised the question. Uh, and really, that's what is being discussed. How do we have nation states, individual countries, first of all, getting it right, and maybe it relates to the disaggregation that was being talked about, and it is just three layers, really, in my view. One is uh, the nation, country level, regional level, and then the continental level. I think there should be that soul searching and looking for practical ways to address most of these problems that underlie lack of security and, and, and stability on our continent. President Kagame, thank you very much. To the rest of our panelists, thank you very much. From the floor, thank you. Uh, former President Mbeki, former President Mkapa. To all the other participants, I know there are many issues that we didn't get to touch in this session, but I think some of the ones that we did have ho hopefully given you some food for thought and certainly, hopefully, I think, have gone down to question and, and encourage some better dis discourse. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, thank you very much for being such great panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry we couldn't get to more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.